Where does your passion for economics come from? Well, I actually started in high school really liking science, uh, you know, physical science, and I got interested in doing research from taking an advanced biology course in high school, and I went off to college planning to be a molecular biologist. And I'd been interested in, um, in economics, uh, partly because I was interested in some history, and then I took a course in economics in my junior year in high school, which is highly unusual. Um, it was called uh, Seminar on Capitalism or something like that. And read a book by Milton Friedman um, called Capitalism and Freedom. So that, that's where I first experienced economics. And then my senior year in high school, I helped um, sort of co-run this economics seminar that I took in my junior year. And we, I read a textbook by Paul Samuelson, who was the second Nobel Prize winner, the second prize winner in the memory of Alfred Nobel in economic sciences. Uh, and that was like an am amazingly good um, textbook. So I read that. But I had no thought of ever doing economics because um, I didn't really know any economists. So that, I got interested in science and research through biology. I went to college, Brown University, went to college, started to take some organic chemistry and some of these sciences. And at least at a low level, they were very, um, a lot of memorization was required. At the low levels, the, the science courses were less experimental than I was, was used to, and memorization is not my thing. So I actually dropped organic chemistry three weeks into the term at, at my freshman year, and then needed something that met at the same time. So there was an intermediate microeconomics course that I took, and it was an amazing, very, very advanced course, as it turned out, and I could, it didn't have a prerequisite, and I already had this reading of the Paul Samuelson textbook, so I didn't have to take what is economics course. So by that term, I wasn't thinking about being an economist, but I sort of liked the economics course. And in the second part of my freshman year, the second semester, there was a continuation of the course that was more mathematical economics, um, taught by a mathematical economist. And at that point, I was thinking, hey, this stuff is actually pretty interesting, and I thought it was very easy. And then I learned that easy is good. This is thing in economics called comparative advantage. You do what you're relatively good at. Uh, you may not be the smartest person, or you may be the smartest person in the world, but you link with, the, you list the things you're relatively good at, and you should be in the one that you're relatively best at. So that's how I sort of got into economics. And then it was sort of random what types of economics I was interested in for a while after that. What advice would you give to a student or young researcher? If I wanted to give advice to someone just starting to think about going into research of some sort, scientific research, could be economics, could be any type of science, I would tell the students that there's a great joy in, learn, in understanding something that you completely or the world completely misunderstood in the past. So the, the benefit of being a researcher is, is resolving a puzzle. And I think that's something, that's what I got into economics from wanting to be a molecular biologist. And I did a lot of lab experiments in biology. And these were resolving puzzles that I had. You know, they were already resolved by other people because they were existing experiments. So I think if we want to get more people to go into doing research in, in the sciences, expressing to people what, what you actually do day to day is, is, is important. So, the joy of understanding something that was confusing, that's what motivates me, and I think it motivates a lot of scientists. Uh, so that would be my advice, is realize that that's the whole point of this. It's very easy to treat this as like a regular job where you just want to get a lot of people to cite your work. You want to change people's minds about things, and then that's fun. You can't always do it, though, sometimes. Sometimes you say, yeah, what people thought before, they were exactly right. Okay, I'll move on to another question. Do you ever feel pressure knowing so many people have read, cited, or built upon your work? I think it's safe to say when uh, either of my highly cited papers, even Diamond Divig, which is the bank run model from um, 1983, or my Diamond 84 financial intermediation delegated monitoring, I didn't even think about 
citations as something that mattered at that point or something that would ever be uh, uh, measured. So when, when we were writing those paper, when I was writing the paper on my own, which was from my doctor dissertation, or the paper with Phil Divig, we were basically thinking, okay, we want to try to explain what's going on. It'd be nice if we could get this thing published. So we were thinking more about getting people to read it and getting it published than having it cited. Certainly for the bank runs paper, we were hoping that policymakers read it. So that's a little bit of a different measurement than citations. Um, and, and the paper, I mean, got a lot of attention, but the number of citations in that paper, surprisingly, is like relatively constant year by year. It doesn't tend to go up. It went up a little bit during the financial crisis of 2008. But basically, it sort of keeps getting cited today at more or less the same rate it was cited, you know, 10 years after it was published. So normally, papers that are huge hits get lots of their citations very, very fast particularly in empirical work where people are trying to either refute it or extend it. So since ours was about trying to help people think about something, um, I, I would not have guessed that this would have been a tremendously cited paper. We were actually pretty proud of that paper when we wrote it because it came out so clean. And people that we presented it to, including my mentor Steve Ross, was clear, was clear to us that that paper was going to have a big impact. So we probably thought it would have had 50 or 60 citations or something like that, and it had a, had a few more than that. What skills are important for students or researchers to develop? I'd say the most important skill for a researcher is keeping an open mind about what the answer to a question might be. It's very easy, particularly as you get more senior as a researcher, to be affiliated, have your mind focused on certain answers that you found in the past and trying to look for either new data or new theories that are consistent with your old views. I think a lot of what we learn from research is overturning old ideas with either slightly better or very much better ideas. Um, I mean, trying to be open-minded about the way one does research and what the answers are uh, and not bringing your preconceived either notions about the world or your political views and things like that. And I'd say that's, that's, that's probably the most important. Why do you think it's important for students and researchers to approach and explain complicated subjects? When I think about writing a paper as well as building the theory that the paper will ultimately be based on, I think about what's the key feature that we want to try to understand here. So I tend to, I don't always succeed, I tend to make it as simple and um, one feature at a time uh, an analysis as possible. And so one reason that Phil and I tried to make our paper on bank runs relatively clean and simple is we realized some of the audience someday might be central bankers and bank regulators and the public as opposed to other economists. So we made that paper like relatively um, straightforward um, for that reason, for the audience reason. The second thing in keep making the paper with on bank runs simple is we originally thought about a somewhat more complicated model, not that it was so difficult to solve, but that uh, it had an unnecessary feature in it. So the basic idea in, in, the, in, the, in the Diamond Divig model is that the bank's assets, like its loans, are illiquid. So if you tried to sell them or liquidate them or get rid of them in a hurry before they matured, you would get a tiny fraction of what they're worth. So we originally started with an idea explaining why bank loans in particular were illiquid assets. And it was some complicated story that the bank, to sort of commit a small fraud, would be having loans that were not going to be likely to be repaid, quote unquote, bad loans. And that instead of foreclosing on them, they'd roll them over and keep lending money to the firm uh, to hide the fact that the, 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 the loan was not going to be repaid. That by itself would make it illiquid because people are, they're buying a loan, a used loan from a bank. It could be it's one of these bad ones that they're just keeping around for fraudulent purposes. 
So we thought about that was complicated, but then we realized the main point that we had about borrowing short-term and lending long-term illiquid was true for almost any reason that a loan was illiquid. So putting in a particular reason why the loan was illiquid was counterproductive. It was, if we want to make the point as, as generally and simply at the same time, generality and simplicity went together that for whatever reason the bank loan is illiquid, there are lots of reasons you couldn't sell it for what it's worth. If that's true, the bank would be subject to a run. And then subject to a run for good reasons, because you'd like to issue short-term debt against long-term um, illiquid loans. For the purpose when there's not a run, you create an asset that's more liquid than other assets out there. On the other hand, if you're Turns out, when if you're doing that, if you're creating this liquid asset, if everybody thinks it's gonna, f every, if think everybody thinks that everybody else is gonna withdraw, that is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Was there a person who influenced you? Steve Ross was definitely a mentor and role model to me, um, and uh, to all of his students. All of Steve Ross's students set up this um, foundation called the Foundation for Advancement of Research in Financial Economics. We all donated money to it, fairly significant amounts of money, so it could set up something called the Steve Ross Prize. So, and we all contributed to a volume explaining what a great mentor Steve Ross was. Uh, so Steve Ross was a person who was particularly gifted at helping individuals figure out what they were good at. So he didn't produce lots of little Steve Rosses, he produced lots of people who do various, various different things. So without Steve, I don't think I would have succeeded in learning how to build simple models that had new ideas in them, but at the same time were quite applied. So doing a, what's applied theory, which sounds like a contradiction in terms, um, doing applied theory is an art, and Steve was very good at teaching people how to do that art. And he was a very encouraging, strong advocate for all of his students. So even if we were all feeling awful about our work, he would point out the one good part of it that was there, and we could, we could focus on that one good part. He's probably the biggest, the biggest influence. My other advisors, uh, James Tobin and Martin Schubick, uh, were my advisors for the whole time, but Steve Ross appeared in year three of my PhD. In, in the years one and two, I actually got my interests in banking and finance uh, cemented, and both James Tobin, uh, who's a, who's a Nobel Prize winning macroeconomist, uh, and Martin Schubick, who was a game theorist microeconomist, they were both um, very clear that the financial system wasn't well integrated into the rest of economics. And from them, I sort of learned where the holes were in economic theory. And they had their own ideas on how to fill those holes. I had different ideas, but learning where the holes are that's invaluable when you're trying to figure out what to do research on. So they were also very strong mentors, but I think I'd probably still be in graduate school trying to finish my thesis if it wasn't for Steve Ross. How do you cope with failure? Uh, the older I get, the easier it is to push forward when something doesn't work. Because uh, in my own personal experience, most times when something doesn't work, if I just keep working on it, eventually it does. So I haven't, maybe fewer than 20% of the projects that I started ended up nowhere with just having to go into the trash. But more often than not, the project starts out as trying to understand or build a model of some phenomenon. Then I build a model of it, with I or sometimes with co-authors, sometimes by myself, build a model of the thing I was trying to build a model of, and sometimes it doesn't quite deliver what I expected. So often what I can do is figure out what this model I just built is a model of and say, well, that's the answer to some other question. Other times, I'll say, okay, this other question isn't that interesting, but then I'll change the model a little bit to make it go back to what I was originally trying to get at. And then I've learned two things. One, the second model is the model of what I wanted. And the second thing I learned is if you just change these assumptions from where I started to where I finish, I got a totally different economic outcome. And sometimes just the change in the assumptions to the change in the outcome is informative in and of itself. Um, 
Former Nobel Prize winner Bengt Holmström has a name for this called the conversation with the model. So normally you think you learn in the world from putting a model, taking it to data, and seeing what the data tell you. So it turns out if you're into, if you know something about the world already and you're good at looking at models, you can somehow learn from a model if you just change, what, what, what the, the model's a mapping from assumptions you make to conclusions the model produces. Sometimes learning about that mapping from assumptions and conclusions is interesting and informative in and of itself. And that's been true on, on multiple occasions. So as a, as a result, I haven't had to trash too many projects. Most of the projects I've trashed is once I actually finished the model, I was realized that it just was a model of something I already knew. Uh, so I said, okay, I produced something that isn't original, so who wants to do unoriginal uh, research? What are the key implications of your research? So, my research is in a few areas. The main area and the area that the, the, you know, the prize committee uh, highlighted uh, is on thinking about what do banks do in the economy um, why do they do it? Why do they provide some good or bad elements to the economy? And then what are the implications for things like financial crises or the proper allocation of capital across firms or access to liquidity for people? Uh, so th that's the area. And th there's sort of several types of implications. One type of implication for just understanding um, if something goes wrong in the financial system, um, why uh, the contracts that people write that have these sometimes have bad outcomes, like a financial crisis or a bank run or something like that, why they wrote those contracts in the first place? So if we're trying to under, it's a, so a lot of the questions that I ask are why questions. Why do we do it this way as opposed to that way? Why don't we do it this other way? And then why questions sound like they're very unapplied. It's a, you know, we want to know how much to do it or what to do rather than why we do it. But for novel experiences like a financial crisis or a new type of financial institution or a huge change in the economy because of like a war, something like that, knowing why certain things uh, are, are, are done or are not done uh, t turns out to be somewhat important. So the, the biggest implications, the biggest application for the stuff, so Phil Divig and I did research on bank runs, and the question we ask is why do banks or other financial institutions that are similar to banks write contracts which leave them subject to a run, or a panic, where everybody's rushing to get their money out because other people are rushing to get their money out. So if you understand, and that means the banks that are perfectly healthy can be going out of business just because fear of fear itself or a panic stepped in. It's just, um, it started to happen. If, if you're a policymaker, uh, you need to know why a, a, a panic is occurring, what you can do to help resolve it if you hadn't fixed it in advance by like deposit insurance or something. And in addition, I say the most useful thing that came out of the research that Phil and I did was to make very clear that bank runs aren't just about banks. They're not about how much currency you have in the vault, like they say in the movie It's a Wonderful Life. You know, I don't have the money in the vault. Their money's in Joe's house. So it's not about money in the vault. That certainly is a problem, but it's about issuing short-term debt to finance long-term illiquid businesses or, or, or loans. So it could be Lehman Brothers. It could be a cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, it could be stable coins, things like that. So that's that's the, the key thing is that this problem of runs and crises, which are self-fulfilling problems, could be in many parts of the economy. What made you think that there was more to uncover with bank runs? So the, there's an interesting question about deposit insurance and whether once we have deposit insurance, do we no longer have to worry about financial crises? So an interesting implication of the work that I did with Phil Divig is that it's about short-term debt and not about being a bank. So if you are Lehman Brothers or you are um, 
a securitization where you put a bunch of loans or mortgages into a pool and then issue claims against them. Uh, and they issue something called asset-backed commercial paper, which is short-term debt on a securitization. Once you see that these things that are not banks can have runs, then you can't rest as easy saying, oh, we have deposit insurance on the bank, so the banks won't have runs. Well, then maybe the banks won't have runs based on deposit insurance, but you'll have the runs elsewhere. And the activity of creating liquidity, borrowing short-term to finance long-term, migrates out of the regulated sector. So it's important. So, I mean, people knew there were bank runs. I mean, so did we. You know, we've, that's the history we were trying to explain. People understood that if you didn't keep enough currency in the vault, that a bank could be, a, it's called fractional reserves. If you didn't have enough currency in the vault, there could be a bank run. Uh, but no one had really thought about, okay, why do we write these contracts that are subject to runs? What's the, if it's not currency in the, devol, in the vault, what is it? And then so deposit insurance is a good thing to protect part of the financial sector, but it can't protect the whole, protect the whole thing. And I, I think I mentioned before, a lot of the, the work that I do is why something happens. So it's important to reevaluate why something happens because maybe it was done in the past for a good reason, the why reason was a good reason back then, but if things change over time in the economy or the laws or uh, the climate, uh, if, if, the, if the why reason is no longer valid, you've got to make sure that laws and regulations or regulators that sort of prop up a particular part of the financial system or any part of the economy, you're not propping up something which is obsolete. It's not, you know, it, the why, if the why is no longer relevant, uh, it's, it, it's, it's important to know that. You've said that you don't like to work on the hot topics. How do you come across things that people aren't already thinking about? Yes, yeah, so I definitely do not base my research on what is happening today. Uh, when uh, Two things. When my research is relevant to what's happening today, then, in some sense, I address a broader audience. So like when the big financial crisis of 2008, 2007 through 9 occurred, I more I slowed down the amount of basic research that I was doing and spent more time talking to policymakers and the public about financial crises. In the early stages there of, the, of that financial crisis, that we saw the crisis, there was no actual data. So I'm a theorist, so someone who just thought for 30 years about the issues probably should speak you know, their mind about what they think is going on. Um, so to that extent, I work on the, of the, of the, the, the flavor of the week or the, the issue of the day. But I basically work on what I'm interested in and what I feel like I have an insight into. And the work that Phil Divig and I did on bank runs was not thought at the time to be very topical. In fact, the very first time I gave the paper at the University of Pennsylvania, someone in the audience said, this paper is very interesting, but it should be in the economic history workshop instead of the economic theory workshop, because we learned long ago that financial crises are not a problem in developed economies. We learned how to fix them. So that was completely wrong, as it turned out. So I... There's an incentive as a, as a scholar who wants to get attention to work on what, what's currently topical. But unless you happen to have some insight uh, into what's the current flavor of the week topic, I, I, it generates more bad research than good. I, I like to do what, what, what I know how to do, which is narrow but deep. <laughs> Can you tell us about the object that you're donating to the Nobel Prize Museum? Turned, it's like I actually struggled to find an artifact to, to, to donate. I'm a what's called a pencil and paper theorist, so I didn't have any data. Uh, a lot of what I learned about the world, I learned from observing the world or reading books in economic history and things like that. So I struggled, and I was looking through my files and archives. I had an exam, a, a, a handwritten take-home exam from a course I took in college which was a tremendously influential course to me. And it was a course called The Economic History of the United States. And it was basically an, a, an undergraduate one semester course that was an entire book by Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz called The Monetary History of the United States. And most 
interesting part of that book was about the 1930s when there were a tremendous number of bank runs and bank failures. And actually, in another course, in the second semester, which was a PhD course, we used just that chapter of the book. So I read that book very carefully twice. So in this, this exam, which I didn't remember that I had, there was an analysis of what would have been different in the 1930s if the Federal Reserve had pegged the interest rate at a constant level. And, and the question is, would the bank failures have been more or less? It's, that, that wasn't the question. What would have been different in the macro? So I read my answer, and I didn't remember this at all, and my answer said, well, it looked like a lot of the, uh, it looked like a lot of the um, predictions that normal um, models would have would say the, the, the bank failures only affected the money supply. It wouldn't affect what was going on in the real economy. And I realized in my answer, I questioned that. I didn't know how to model that, but I was questioning what's the effect of banks on the real economy when I was, you know, in 1975, when I was still in college. So I was thinking, where did I get interested in this stuff? It turned out that was, that was it. Mm -hmm.